Hi, everyone. For our last lecture of the week, we're going to talk about what constitutional limits are placed on criminal procedure law. So what we're going to look at is what kind of things help or require are required in our criminal procedure law to make our criminal procedure law constitutional. OK, so I'm going to share my PowerPoint and you can follow along as we go through the material. So hopefully you remember that our constitution is the supreme law of the land. So this constitution is going to affect what our criminal procedure laws are. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. So I just want you to read this scenario and think about Bill and his bad day. So read through it to yourself and write down some things that you think the government can and cannot do, okay? So stop this, read through it and write, I think they can do this. I don't think they can do that, okay? And just write them down. And then when you're done, you can start the video again. So one of the things we wanna talk about is what, what, what controls the constitutional plays on those things and how they influence what can be done and what cannot be done, okay? So it is important to remember that the US Constitution is our supreme law of the land. That means it controls everything. Nothing can exist that violates our US Constitution. If it does, then it's unconstitutional. So we have to think about how that affects our criminal procedure law, okay? So when we look at the actual Constitution, let's think of how it's structured. So the Constitution has Articles 1, 2, and 3, which we talked about the first lecture, and it creates the legislative branch, the executive branch, and judicial. So the legislative, it creates Congress, the executive branch, it creates the presidency, and then the judicial, we talked about, it creates the Supreme Court. Not only does it create our government, though, right after that, it starts to place limits on that government so that the government can't control or take away things that we consider our fundamental rights, okay? So when we think about these three branches, which branch gets to interpret what the Constitution says? And that's the judicial branch, and that's the Supreme Court, okay? Now, since all of this is based on how our government is set up, I posted some videos online that you can either watch or not watch. They're voluntary if you want, but it just reviews the preamble of the constitution, which is the purpose of our constitution. And then Three Ring Circus just shows you how these three branches were created and how they are all limited and checks and balances and how it's set up. I also have posted a branches of government assessment if you just want to review the structure of our government so you have some understanding of how it's set up. <clears throat> we are going to mostly look at the Supreme Court, obviously, in here. Remember I told you before that the Supreme Court is created in Article 3 of our Constitution, the Judicial Department. It's the only court that's mandatory, must exist based on our Constitution, all the other lower courts are created by a Judiciary Act. And what the Supreme Court does is it gave itself the power of judicial review. Judicial review is the ability to look at a court case and <clears throat> determine if it's constitutional or not constitutional. That's the idea of judicial review. That concept came forward through the court case of Mulberry versus Madison. It didn't exist prior to that. It was the court case of Mulberry versus Madison that first um, developed that concept, okay? Now, what do you think? What factors affect how a Supreme Court will make its decision? Again, we kind of mentioned this. We talked about precedent and stare decisis. But there's a lot that goes into judicial decision making and influences on why Supreme Court decides the way it does. So I want you to stop this and go and watch Crash Course's Judicial Decisions. And it really gives you a great overview of why the Supreme Court would make the decisions that they make, okay? Now, one of the things they talk in that video about is this conflict between what we call legal realists and uh, formalists. 
<clears throat> Legal realists believe that our constitution is a living, breathing document that changes as society changes, okay? So it's not a stagnant document and that it's the court's job to be judicially active and interpret that and to change our rules based on changing times as long as they reflect the principles of our constitution. Other people are what we call formalists or originalists. Formalists or originalists are the people that believe the constitution should be interpreted exactly as it was written when it was originally created. They are strict constructionists. They don't believe that the courts should be interpreting it based on today's society. It should be strictly interpreted based on how it was originally written. They also believe in what we call judicial restraint. They want less action from the court. They want the, the, the court to not be active in certain cases if they are able to not be active. Okay, so I also posted a video on this original versus living constitutionalism difference video. So if you're conflicted or don't understand the distinctions between these, um, you can stop it and watch that video. It's really good. Okay. Now, one of the concepts that you need to be really familiar with is the idea that the Supreme Court sets the baseline of what your rights are. Okay, so that long yellow arrow is the baseline and it sets the baseline of what your rights are. The courts can never give less rights than what that baseline says. They can give more, you can have more rights than the courts say. If, the, if a state wants to give you more protections, that's fine. But states and lower courts can never give less than what the Supreme Court has said is your base. So if they say X is a constitutional right, you can give more than that, but you can never give less than what the federal court says. Okay. Now, when we look at the, the um, procedural law, we're mostly going to be dealing with what we call the Bill of Rights. So remember, we have the first articles of the Constitution, one, two, and three, create our government, and then we have it re limit its power. And the Bill of Rights is the first 10 amendments to the Constitution and puts some huge limits on governmental powers. So if you're not familiar or you forgot what your Bill of Rights are, I posted a review video online. You should watch that to refresh your memory. You need to know what the first 10 amendments are to the Constitution because that's what we're gonna be using for the most part in this class throughout the whole semester. So the ones we're gonna look at the most are the fourth, fifth, sixth, eighth, and 14th amendment. Okay, so you need to know what those are because those are the ones we're gonna go over and over throughout the class and really be talking about the most because they're the ones that deal with criminal procedure law the most. So when you think about it, you would say, Bob is pulled over for a broken headlight. He is pulled out of the car, thrown to the ground and his vehicle is searched. So we have police procedure, criminal procedure. We have to decide, does that violate any of our Bill of Rights or amendments to our constitution? And you could say that clearly violates our fourth amendment. James is sentenced to 25 years in prison for a minor drug possession charge. Which one of the Bill of Rights would be affected by this? And that would be your eighth amendment. Craig is arrested and placed in jail. He does not know what he's accused of doing. That is going to be your fifth amendment. So fourth amendment for arrest, fifth amendment just thrown in jail, not told, due process. You have to be told what your charges are. Kerry is beaten until he confesses to a crime. So that is also going to be fifth amendment, sixth amendment, the right against self-incrimination, the right to an attorney, Okay, so the different things that consist are existent in the Bill of Rights affect the procedural law that we have to deal with. Now, we're going to look at, for the rest of the class, two provisions, and mostly just one, but we're going to talk about the idea of due process and equal protection. So when you're talking about criminal procedure law, that law cannot violate these two provisions. So due process and equal protection. So we're gonna look at each one of those. So we'll start with equal protection because then we're gonna finish up with due process. 
So equal protection says no state shall deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protections of the law. So this is right in our constitution. All laws have to equally protect all people in every jurisdiction. So can you think of any way that the government would violate this procedure? <clears throat> so how would the government violate equal protection? Well, what if they created a law that said women cannot drink alcohol ever, only men are allowed to drink alcohol? That would not be equal protection under the law. It would not be a law that applies equally to all people in the country. That's a violation of equal protection. Another one would be selective prosecution. You only choose to prosecute um, African-American black people and you don't prosecute white people. That would be a violation of equal protection, okay? Now, when you look at a law and you're deciding, does that law disproportionately affect one group over another or is everybody treated equal? You look at two different things. Discriminatory purpose. Was the law written specifically to treat certain people different? Disparate treatment. So my example of alcohol and females and males, it was sole purpose was to keep females from drinking. That's disparate treatment. Okay. Now discriminatory effect could be you write the law and you think it's neutral, but it has a disproportionate effect on certain groups. So one of the laws that has often come under criticism is the cocaine crack laws. If you were caught with cocaine, it was a smaller punishment than if you were caught with crack. They're both the same substance ultimately, but richer people, people with a lot of money were able to get their hands on cocaine and crack ended up being the drug of the lower um, economic status people because it was cheaper to get. So it ended up also um, being disproportionately used by minorities. So if you got caught with crack, you got life in prison, but if it was cocaine, you only got a shorter sentence. It, had, it wasn't written to be that way, but the effect was that it was affecting one group worse than the other group, okay? So the one I really wanna talk about is due process. So there are two amendments in the constitution that deal with due process the Fifth Amendment and the 14th Amendment. So basically due process is fairness, right? Protecting citizens from the government so they will not be deprived of life, liberty, or property without proper protections. So due process is proper protections, procedures or things that are set in our law to make sure we are all properly get our rights. That's the concept of due process. Now, when you talk about due process, there's two types of due process. There's procedural due process and there's substantive due process. So substantive due process are the rights that every citizen in the whole country has. Freedom of religion, freedom of speech, uh, freedom of press. They're like fundamental rights that we all have. Procedural due process are those procedures that are set in place to make sure the trial process is fair speedy trial, jury, impartial jury, warrant procedures. So those are procedures that are put into place to make sure that your liberties are upheld, okay? So if you're talking about you're denying an attorney, that's a substantive right. Everybody has the right to an attorney, okay? But it's also procedural because you have to have a procedure of having an attorney to go through the proper court procedure. You're arrested for refusing a soldier a bed for the night. That's a substantive right. You are told you can't have a jury. That's a procedural right. The police bring you or present you with an arrest warrant to arrest you. The arrest is a procedure. Um, you're arrested for protesting government actions, freedom of protest. That's a substantive right. You are denied the right to privacy. The right to privacy is a right that everybody has. That's a substantive right. 
So as you can see with the first one, sometimes things kind of cross over. You do have a substantive right to an attorney, but it's also a procedure that has to occur within the procedural law. Okay, so we are in criminal procedure law. So we're gonna be talking about procedural due process. So if you take criminal law, that's substantive due process, we're gonna talk about procedural due process. So when we're talking about procedural due process, we're talking about fair procedures. We want the trial process that when you're accused of a crime, that process you go through, we want that to be done fairly and that everybody has same protections. So what the courts have said is to have fair procedure, you need two things. You need number one, notice. You need to notify the person what the charges are against them, what the evidence is against them and when their trial is going to be. That's notice. We need to let people know what's going on. The second part is a hearing, which means you have to have an actual trial. So you have to have a process put in place to determine if you are in fact guilty or not guilty. So when you hear procedural due process, those two things should always pop up in your mind, notice and hearing. If you are missing either one of those things, it violates due process, notice and hearing. Now these are all identified in the Fifth Amendment and the 14th Amendments that we were talking about. Another thing you have to think about is conflicting powers of state versus federal. So the state government wants certain powers, and then the federal government has certain powers. So who determines which one wins out? So the states could say, well, we're not going to do X, but the federal government is saying you, you need to do X. Now, remember, we said the Supreme Court sets the boundary but you can always give more or less. So we have to figure out who gets the deciding voice in those due process powers. Now this has changed over the history of time. Originally, we thought the states had all the power to determine what was fair process. So we know there's notice, we know there's a hearing, but what that included was left up to the states, okay? So the federal government said that the federal constitution provided these things, but states could pick and choose which ones they wanted to apply in their states. That's what we call selective incorporation. Not all of the Bill of Rights applied to the states. We only applied the Bill of Rights that we think deal with fundamental fairness to the states. Over time, well, I, not even over time. There's another group of people that believe in total incorporation. That means the states have to abide by every single thing in the Bill of Rights, every single thing. It's not selective, you don't get to choose. Totally incorporate. Everything that's in the Bill of Rights has to be incorporated at the state level, okay? So these are two different views of the Constitution and it goes to the balance between state power and federal power. States think they should have the right to decide what rights their people in their state have. Total incorporation says, nope, you don't get to decide. All of the Bill of Rights have to apply. Now, it has changed over time how we view this. So originally, um, we had public order crime control. So states got to decide that depending on how much they want to stop crime. They didn't have to give as much procedural protections. And then we have total incorporation that are focused on individual rights to process all the time. And they're more involved with federal rights. Now, does the Bill of Rights specifically say that the due process of protections apply to states? No, it doesn't say that, right? In Hadari, Hadaro, um, D, uh, I'm sorry, Had Hurtado versus California. There's a Hardari D case we're going to talk about. Hurtado versus California. The Supreme Court said it is up to the states. The states get to decide which provisions of due process protections apply at the state level. So it did not require states to apply all of the Bill of Rights. So that swung much more to public order and states getting to decide. It's a local matter. 
the government can't force procedures on the states. But then in the 1930s and 40s, we had World War II, right? And we saw the rise of this all powerful people that were taking away constitutional rights. And people in this country started to think, you know what, we want to make sure we have our constitutional rights. We're not gonna let states choose not to give us those rights. So then we swung much harder towards individual rights due process, okay? So we moved much more to selective incorporation with more and more Bill of Rights being incorporated at the state level. So originally it started out selective incorporation. We're only gonna incorporate those provisions of the Bill of Rights that we think are most fundamental for fairness in our system. So notice of the charges and hearings, but none of the other things. We're not gonna make states provide all of those other fundamental things that we always required at the federal level. So this was just an activity for you to start thinking about it. So you can stop the video and rank these things in order of what you think is most essential from number one to the most important down to what you would be willing to give up. And then when you're done, you can start the video. So if you look at your bottom three, if you were a selective incorporation, states would probably not be required to give those last three. They would only selectively incorporate the ones that they consider the most fundamental. Okay, that's selective incorporation. So we had selective incorporation originally. And one of the things was, what about certain rights? So we had the Scottsboro brothers or Scottsboro, um, Scottsboro boys case. These were, uh, I think there were eight um, African-American boys. They were jumping the trains and there was a one white girl that was riding with them. They got arrested at a site and then she turned on them and said that they were raping her and kidnapping her. So within a week, they convicted them and they gave them all the death penalty. And the Supreme Court said, you know what? We're not gonna let the courts or the state level choose that. We're going to require that the right to a jury, the right to a, attorneys, those things are going to be required at the state level. And this was later affirmed by Brown versus Mississippi, which we'll talk about a lot later. And what the court said is yes, although they are, we're going to now require states to provide due process, we still won't require everything, only things that we consider the most fundamentally fair to, to people in the system, okay? So as you can see, as the years went by, the court started to find more and more things as fundamental. So search and seizures, 1949, exclusionary rule, 1961, self-incrimination, 1964, the court started to say more and more things were fundamental fairness and states had to incorporate them. The most recent is the uh, unanimous verdict in a criminal case. Federal law required an unanimous verdict in a criminal case, but not the states. Now the states also require that. The only one that's not that I know of right now is grand jury indictments. Most states do require grand jury indictments, but not every state, okay? So we are more and more moving towards total incorporation where states will not have a choice. Every single provision in the Bill of Rights will have to be upheld by the states. The key word for this week is total incorporation. So make sure that you write that down and you're ready uh, to submit that for watching this video. Total incorporation. Okay. And then the last thing you need to remember, even with total incorporation, even though you have these rights, they still can be limited, but you have to have valid basis of evidence to do it. So the more freedoms we take away, which we can still take away, the more evidence we have to do have. So if we want to stop you, we need reasonable suspicion. If we want to arrest you, it's more restrictive on your freedoms. We need probable cause. If we want to put you in jail, we need beyond a reasonable doubt. 
if we want to give you the death penalty, we need a bifurcated two-part trial and we need to balance um, aggravating mitigating circumstances, the highest standard. So depending on it, even if we incorporate all your rights, they can still be limited, but only if we have very good reasons to do so, okay? So what I want you to do is take what this says and start doing chapter two assignment. So read through chapter two assignment. Now you are dr a Derek drug dealer's attorney and you are going to argue that his procedural due process rights were violated. So as a hint, remember for procedural due process, you need notice and a fair hearing. So in your answers, make sure your argument is either arguing that he wasn't given notice of something or something was not provided that made him have a fair hearing. So make sure those things are incorporated in your answer. Those are the types of things I'm looking for. You're gonna argue that his procedural due process rights were not um, or were, were violated because either his notice or hear, fair hearing or both provisions were violated. Make sure you explain to me why, how, be specific, okay? And then do you think he will win? That's the last part, okay? So that is your last lecture video for this week. Um, if you have any questions, reach out. I know it gets a little confusing with this, this stuff. I will tell you that you do need to know the distinction between selective incorporation, fundamental fairness and total incorporation. There is something on the exam. So make sure you understand those. If you don't, I posted some videos to help you make sure you understand. So uh, I hope all is well, and don't forget, you can always reach out to me if you have any questions. Good luck.